So I'm going to talk about lateral surgery. And for me, um, my other passion is spine surgery um, and uh, doing minimally invasive lateral surgery. And I sort of, um, here are my disclosures, I, I sort of in the last decade, and I think Shane kind of talked about it a little bit, is it was appealing for me because being a neurosurgeon, you know, um, we just never got a lot of deformity training. We got some, but it's historically been something that, that uh, orthopedic surgeons did. So I had an interest in deformity, and I wanted to figure out if there was a better way to do this. Um, and as Dr. Pauly and others have mentioned, is, you know, doing a PSO is a big operation. What if you can correct a, a, a scoliosis, a kyphosis, and do it in such a way, and it's a different concept. So what if you can lengthen the spine and correct the curve instead of shorten the spine and correct the curve? So it's a completely different, um, and I think it's novel, but as we talked about earlier in Dr. Dobbs' talk, you know, there's a lot of floor exposure. Um, it's a challenging approach. It's all new anatomy. I mean, I'd never... I didn't even know what the retroperitoneal space was in medical school, let alone residency. The only time I remember I got into it one time on a shunt operation, and my attending was like, Rod, you're an idiot. What are you doing? This is the peritoneum. This is the retroperitoneum. And it's something, you know, urologists are trained in, but, you know, I don't think orthopedic surgeons or neurosurgeons really understand it. Um, and again, you know, where's the kidney? There's all this, all these important relationships. Dr. Tubbs talked about. There's a diaphragm. Um, there's uh, um, there's a vascular uh, structures. So really, um, and this is uh, a lot of these um, slides I stole from Dr. Tubbs. But you know, the the figures, the anatomy, um, it's all for textbooks. None of it is is real life. Um, and so we're. We're working on, and Dr. Tubbs is actually working on this, but we're working on projects together to really try to define, for example, in the lumbar plexus, we know this doesn't look like this. There's actually branches, I'm going to show you, that interconnect to all the different levels. Um, and none of the textbooks, I mean, I've never seen anything like this in a human. You know, it's good for cartoons and textbooks. But this is what it looks like. And actually, this is Dr. Tubbs' um, uh, uh, depiction. There's nerves everywhere. And all these nerves are important. You can't cut any of them. I remember when I first started doing it, you know, they, uh, when they were teaching us how to do this, they said, okay, make two, maybe three incisions, put your finger in there, swipe everything around. Well, guess what? There's nerves everywhere in there. You know, so you're you're swiping. I remember I would be, you know, like trying to figure out where everything was. Well, you're moving nerves around. You're moving. You know, there's there's actually structures in there. Um, and initially, when I did it, we'd bovi through the muscle. You know, and now we it's all. You know, we don't cut any muscle. We dilate through everything. So the approach has evolved. Um, we don't make two. We don't make three incisions. Um, and uh, it's, it's really understanding the anatomy. Um, and again, you know, most, even the anatomical stuff that you see here, it's not really relevant to the approaches. So even the anatomical textbooks that we use aren't really relevant to doing some of the newer procedures that we have. So this is another um, uh, anatomical um, uh, uh, x-ray of, and Dr. Tubbs put some guide wires in where the nerves run. So it kind of gives you an idea. Again, most I've never seen a surgical textbook that shows the lumbar plexus like this. And this is what it looks like from a lateral approach. So, you know, the nerves are there, the real, some are sensory, some are motor. Um, there's different ways to map them. There's different neuromonic systems that you use. Um, and this is what it looks like. You know, there's interconnections between the nerves. Most of them are motor. There's some sensory branches. And when you get to L4-5, like you do there, it's, it's like the LA, you know, at LAX, you know, trying to get to LAX. You have 405, you have I-5, you have the PCH, you have all these important nervous structures, and, and they don't actually move. So they're fixed. They, you can't move um, the nerves around. Um, and uh, 
uh, again, as you go up higher, yeah, at L3-4, having a neuropraxia or having a, a femoral neuropathy is less because you can see there's there's not as many um, nerves that are there, but it's you can still have the same problems. Um, so I thought I would just go through some cases rather than um, uh, initially, you know, when I started doing this, we kind of did it on cases that you really would have a difficult time doing it, uh, like a T-lift or a posterior. So I really started doing lateral surgery at, you know, two, three, three, four. And then as I got more comfortable, I started doing cases like this at L3-4, L4-5. This is a patient who had multiple surgeries, got meningitis, got a CSF leak, basically completely fell apart. Here's his um, uh, plain x-rays. No, you know, they'd taken the facet joint, um, and, uh, you know, the, you can see here on flexion, this is an unstable situation. You know, could I go and do an A-lift or um, a, a T-lift? I think he had um, uh, previous abdominal surgery as well. So this is a perfect case for me to um, do a lateral procedure. He's had abdominal surgery, multiple back surgeries. Um, and uh, he's got a spine that looks like this, um, and this is what we ended up doing. But again, these are, you know, when you're going to do lateral, we're going to go in the lab later and uh, look at it, is, you know, you don't want to start out doing a five-level lateral without doing um, some easier cases. Um, and what I've found over time, and these cages are big, and they, they really, you can get a lot of indirect decompression, um, uh, this is the guy's uh, x-rays two years post-op, is you don't always necessarily get a fusion in between where the cage is, but it's such a big cage that, it, you know, usually um, it fuses posteriorly and acts as like anterior column support. Um, and again, I when I first started doing this, you know, the neuromodering was a little dicey, the retractors weren't great, you know, it was hard to get imaging, you know, what did it look like on a fluoro? We were trying to break the bed to open up the, you know, the the levels, and and it's really doing cases like this, you you start to build your confidence. So this is a patient who had adult uh, or adolescent scoliosis surgery, um, and uh, she's like 84, has every single medical problem you can think of, and as um, uh, Dr. Bess and Polly point out, you know, is this a patient that I really want to do a T10, a pelvis? You know, she has a radiculopathy. You can see she's got foraminal stenosis, which is really her main problem. So is there a way that you could treat this, um, that you can open up the nerves and, um, and potentially treat this uh, minimally invasively through a, a lateral approach? This is what we ended up doing. Um, and Again, when you go, being a neurosurgeon, you know, indirect decompression, you don't really believe in it until you get imaging, you get, the, you see the patient's post-op, it really works. And you can see that's the foramen that was compressed on that one side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, when I first started doing it, I think most people go on the concavity because of the number of incisions that you make. Um, and also some people think that if the psoas isn't as um, uh, uh, stretched out, that it's easier to manipulate and move the lumbar plexus around. I've gone both ways. Um, and now I'm actually going on the um, convexity. So I'm going on the opposite side. And, and the reason I'm doing that is I feel that um, I get a better correction. I might have to do a little bit more incisions, but the spine is closer to where I'm working, but it's it's never, it's not, every case is different. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so she had an interesting, they took a ton of bone graft, and she had a solid fusion, I think, down uh, from L4 down to S1. 
Um, and you can see it there on the coronal. Uh, so going back to your questions about looking at, I definitely look, I get, I try to get CTs, um, and even on the MRI, I always look at the, see where the uh, vascular structures are. Um, when I first started doing this, I actually did about, I've done about five or six L5-S1s on people with really severe scoliosis. Um, and uh, looking back on it, I think, you know, there's no question. I think, you know, we've had every injury you can think of doing these approaches, um, kidney, bowel, you know, uh, you name it, you can do it. And you burn L5-S1 through a lateral? Through lateral, yeah. Um, so just like this case, you can, um, on, again, I'm, yeah, so not, not always on some of these really severe curves, you can do it again. I'm not promoting it, but I've, I've done about five and, um, the crest because of the amount of curvature there is, um, you can get to it. But the main issue is, is that it's, it's, it, it you can have vascular issues. Um, you know, at that point. Just it really depends. Okay. If you, yeah. Like, you have to go behind. You have to go behind. You have you have it's not like an OLIF. You're going behind the iliac vessels. Yeah. Um so uh I think um you know uh for me it there isn't any set. So looking at the x-rays, looking at C T, looking at the MRI, um Knock on wood, you know, we haven't had any catastrophes with vascular injuries. We've had um, one iliac vein, uh, um, and uh, we've had one iliac uh, artery, um, um, and uh, both patients ended up doing fine. But um, you can definitely have, I mean, vascular injury is uh, a significant issue. Um, and then here's another case uh, early on. And again, I think the deformity principles still uh, apply. This is a patient that um, that had an L4 to S1 fusion, and looking back on it, you know, and the patient had developed severe stenosis above, and I've, I kind of neglected how significant of a deformity the, the patient had, um, and you know, did something. I probably should have put in iliac uh, fixation, but this was his uh, post-op X-rays. Um, and uh, over about three months, he just started to pull out, and I'll show you on. That's the immediate post-op CT there. You can see we got good, um, big screws, and he had a solid fusion from L4 to S1, and, uh, you know, within, um, so this is six, at six weeks, he pulled out. And um, so we went back in and did a PSO, and, uh, um Got pretty good correction, got about 30 degrees um, at uh, L3. But I think, you know, the deformity principles that we're talking about today, I think you, you really, um, you have to look at the pelvic parameters, the sagittal balance, all those things, um, even if you're doing lateral surgery. Here's another case um, that I did. Uh, again, significant patient had a, a fusion about 20 years ago and has developed a progressive um, kyphoscoliosis. Uh, we ended up doing a, a three-level lateral, and this is what it looks like. And when we do these, uh, I like to stage them, so I don't like to do it all in one day. And um, we get abdominal x-rays and chest x-rays in the PACU. So I've gotten two patients who've had tension pneumothoraxes, because what happens is, is that when you do, when you get up into the thoracolumbar um, uh, region, you can, you can nick the pleura and not even know it. And those are the most dangerous because it's like a ball valve. So here, you know, everything looks good. You get a, you get a chest x-ray or, you know, you're in the OR, you, you don't even think there's an issue. And as soon as the patient, you know, comes, um, uh, out from anesthesia, they pull the tube, the lung collapses like you wouldn't believe. And because I think you've been there, you kind of disrupted the normal um, anatomy. And so I get immediate, like after any, especially, I mean, I do it on every lateral procedure, 
But particularly if you're doing like L1 to L3, I think, you know, I just get a portable chest and abdominal x-ray. Um, and the other thing that can happen is, and this has happened as well, is they, there can be free air on the abdominal x-ray because sometimes you can nick the perineum. So you, you kind of have to, you know, when you look at the abdominal x-ray, you have to keep that in mind. In fact, the radiologist will call you and say, hey, we think, you know, you've got a ruptured um, small intestine, or, and, and it's actually just from the approach. And I actually had, I know of cases where people got exploratory laps, and, you know, it's just basically from the approach. Um, so, again, uh, the deformity principles, we ended up doing a, a long fusion, and, um, and if you look, her balance is not, it's not what it should be. And um, she, over, you know, basically about a year, just started falling over more. Um, and uh, uh, we ended up doing a, um, you can see this is two years post-op. She got increasing uh, kyphosis and um, just kept leaning uh, over more. We did a PSO and then um, a uh, x lift or lateral interbody fusion um, at the level above and below. So it's a good, I think, you know, if you're going to do... I think Bob demonstrated in the lab nicely. You know, you're going to have to get, you have to do something with the disc above and below, um, a lateral procedure or T-lift um, are your options. Here's another case, 58-year-old with multiple, multiple surgeries, had an abscess, um, and then had a, a, a vertebrectomy, and this is what her construct looked like. Had multiple surgeries. Uh, this is what her construct was. And so um, I ended up, uh, and there's her uh, AP x-ray. So she's got significant kyphoscoliosis. So we did a, uh, a thoracic um, VCR and then went laterally and took out that big femoral ring and then closed it posteriorly um, and got this correction. And again, I mean, we probably could have done it all from the back, but I think, you know, when you go laterally, um, you, get, you get a pretty good view of what's going on anteriorly um, and uh, uh, for redo surgeries, um, I like it. This is her post-op x-rays. Um, she's done well. But, you know, it's just, for me, lateral has been, it's just another tool to have in your bag. Um, and I think whatever you're comfortable doing, you, you know, you do. But for these revision surgeries, um, for me, it's been great. And um, that's it.